In philosophy of mind and metaphysics, one of the arguments presented against physicalism is the Mary's room argument or the knowledge argument presented by the philosopher Frank Jackson. The knowledge argument of Frank Jackson proposes that there are certain facts that are inherent in mere experience. I'm going to argue against this position, but first let me flesh out the argument. Premise 1. In her cell, Mary knows all the physical facts. Mary, being a brilliant scientist, knows all the physical facts about color perception, chromatography, the neuroscience of the eye, and many other interrelated disciplines. Mary, however, has never seen color in her life because she lives in a black and white cell. Premise 2. Mary escapes, and upon escape, Mary learns what it's like to see green, blue, red, etc., i.e., she gains new knowledge about the phenomenal properties of color experiences. Premise 3. Mary, upon release, learns new phenomenal facts. These facts are learned independently of Mary's previous knowledge as comprehensive as it was. Premise 4. Hence there are non-physical yet phenomenal facts. These phenomenal facts only exist in Mary's experience of color. Mary's knowledge was lacking in that it did not account for the experience of color that she had upon release from her cell. Premise 5. If physicalism is true, then all phenomenal facts are physical facts. The definition of physicalism is inconsistent with Mary's situation and thus physicalism cannot be true. Conclusion. Therefore physicalism is false. This is Jackson's argument against physicalism. So let's deconstruct this step by step. So starting off, I think the first premise is wrong. There are no physical facts about color. The physical facts describe how electromagnetic radiation is processed by the human eye. Our sense organs process environmental stimuli. Other animals have different sense organs for processing other stimuli. Some animals perceive things that we cannot perceive in principle because of our differences in sense organs. Take the dolphin, for example. The dolphin actually makes far more noises than we can hear. It fires off ultrasonic clicks and whistles like a submarine using sonar. By listening to the echoes of these ultrasonic sound waves, it can build up a sonar picture of the world around it. The beauty of ultrasound is that when it contacts a fish, some of the ultrasonic waves can pass right through the skin. The beam may then reflect back off the bones or guts, resulting in a number of different echoes. Some scientists believe that these echoes are processed in the dolphin's brain to form a 3D image of the fish, which explains why the dolphin's brain is so big. It takes a lot of brain power to be able to hunt by ultrasound. Now Mary, being as brilliant and as erudite as she could be in her field, definitely would have come across the concept of stimulus modalities. Stimulus modalities are the labels we give to our representation of specific environmental stimuli. Though not having seen color, Mary would have known that what her hypothetical test subjects were calling color was simply the label they gave to how their eyes and visual cortices represented various wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. Furthermore, she would know that this particular sense, like all senses, has limits for humans. For most people, this is from approximately 390 nanometers to approximately 700 nanometers. Roy G. Biv. In the same way, assuming that she could hear, she would know that what people call sound is simply the label in English given to the way the ears and the auditory cortex process the vibrations of pressure waves through particles in the air. All of these phenomena are objective. Now, here's where the experiment gets tricky. While the environmental stimuli and energies are objective, the way in which they are classified is not. Furthermore, People with different brains will classify the same stimuli the same way, but not the same percept. In the last video responding to Dearest, 
I highlighted Marvin Minsky's observation that there is an assumption that we all see the same blue. That this qualia, this sensation that, that can't be communicated to anyone else. I don't know if the blue I see looks the same to the blue you see, even though we both call it blue, because that's this first person experience. And the fact that there is a first person experience means that consciousness is something special. Well, the first answer is that what you see as blue is not the same as what I see as blue, because I have different mental processes. So they're making some kind of assumption that's, that's just plain silly. Now that we have that, let's talk about Mary's emergence from her black and white cell. Look at this apple. What color is it? If Mary were to come out of her cell, would you call it green? You probably know where I'm going with this, so I'll spare you and not belabor the point. However, I think we need to recognize that qualia are not facts. They are labels. There is no correct label to give to how an apple reflecting light of 532 nanometers green is represented to you when it's fully given. When I presented this argument to Johann and Rotz of phenomenological relativism of how different people see colors differently, he said that the himba simply access different platonic forms. So Rotz affirms that qualia exist as platonic forms. I would like to thank Epicurus A. Greek for illuminating to me the absurdity of this view. The whole point of platonic forms was to reify concepts and principles that were universal and seemingly innate and available to everyone, that is not and cannot be the case for qualia. They are logically private to each individual. Also, this violates Occam's razor because you're multiplying entities, platonic forms of qualia, way beyond necessity. What's the point if these are just unique to every individual by necessity? This is what happens when you divorce qualia from a perspective. The label is arbitrary, it's not intrinsic in the sensation as many people assume in these sorts of conversations. The givenness of the sensation increases as more connections in the brain are made and more associations are made based on the context and the things they evoke. The labels would be given to the percept according to the society and societal context in which Mary would live. Right now, I'm going over Wilfred Sellers' Keras lectures for my next video on the development of givenness. I will reward you with more and more information regarding qualia and the nature of how subjective experience can originate in primal representations. Thank you for watching.